Hello, I'm Dr. Russell Barkley. I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. Welcome to this internet course on school and classroom management for ADHD children and adolescents. Before we begin, let me disclose to you my sources of support for the previous year so that you can have some idea of whether there exists any potential conflicts of interest with regard to the contents of this presentation. I'm retired from the University of Massachusetts Medical School where I worked for more than 17 years and I receive a pension from the state of Massachusetts for that position. Nevertheless, as is obvious, I am not retired. I've continued to speak for a variety of professional associations, hospitals, and healthcare organizations internationally during the previous year. You can see a list of these on the slide. I also receive royalties for various products that I have created in the ADHD marketplace, including royalties for this course, books, videos, a newsletter, and internet CE courses with other organizations. And finally, I have served as a speaker and consultant for a number of pharmaceutical companies that have ADHD products in the current marketplace. Now let's begin our course on the school management of ADHD. I would like to draw your attention, however, to several resources on this slide that you might find useful to consult in addition to the contents of this program. You will see these here with regard to my own textbook, a handbook of diagnosis and treatment, and especially ADHD in the Schools by George Dupal and Gary Stoner. Most recently, a book for teachers is all about ADHD, the complete practical guide for classroom teachers by Linda Feifner. These and many other products can be found on the internet at major booksellers and at the addwarehouse.com. Before we get into the specifics of classroom management, it may be helpful to review what I consider to be the 18 major principles that should be guiding our choice of management techniques for ADHD. If you've already taken my course on parent counseling and home management, then you've already heard about these ideas. Nevertheless, it will not hurt you to refresh your memory of them. For those who have not yet taken that course, let me go through these ideas uh, in uh, some detail. One of the first great ideas or management principles, in my opinion, has to do with the attitude of the individual being asked to manage the ADHD child, in this case the caretakers, and specifically the teachers in the school system. Teachers need to understand that they are not going to engineer out ADHD out of a child. As you may have learned from my course on this internet website concerning the etiologies of ADHD, ADHD is a major biologically caused disorder. That is to say, its roots lie in neurology and genetics. More than 80% of the variation in ADHD traits in the human population is related to genetic differences in those individuals. The remaining variance appears to be accounted for by exposure to unique events, mostly biological events, and usually having to do with hazards in the environment or pre- and postnatal complications or injuries that may somehow cause maldevelopment of the brain. For more information on the etiologies of ADHD, please take my course on that subject. The point here is that teachers have to come to realize that they are dealing with a child who suffers from a physical disability, even if there are no outward manifestations in the physical appearance of the child that suggest that they are disabled. The brain, nevertheless, is involved in this disorder, and it is not functioning as well as it should, and that results in a neurogenetic disability. So the point is this. Teachers need to accept the disability perspective of ADHD and understand that this is part of the child and the child's personality and the child's approach to their environment. So instead of attempting to get rid of ADHD, Instead, what teachers should be trying to do is to increase the effectiveness of the child and reduce the impairments that occur from this disability. Remember, handicaps are situation-specific. 
whether or not a child is handicapped within the school environment depends upon how we rearrange that environment. Arrange it properly and you can reduce or even eliminate the handicapping nature of disabilities. Disabilities belong to people. Handicaps belong to situations. Readjust the situation and you may improve the child's ability to perform effectively in school. Therefore, the model I prefer the teachers adopt, or the attitude that is, is that they are shepherds of a disabled youngster. They get the important role of rearranging the environment in such a way as to facilitate the growth and development of the child. To follow this metaphor, think of the child as the sheep. Therefore, teachers can arrange pastures around children that help to improve the child's effectiveness in performing in that environment so that even though we don't get to design the sheep, the role of a shepherd is extraordinarily important in protecting, nurturing, and facilitating further the development of the youngster with ADHD. I believe this is a very important first step in understanding management of ADHD within the schools. It all begins with your attitude. Based upon my other courses on this website with regard to executive functioning and ADHD, if you've taken those courses, you will understand that ADHD is a disorder of executive functioning and self-regulation. When viewed from that perspective, a number of treatment recommendations follow. One of these is that ADHD individuals cannot cope with time, with deadlines, or with organizing behavior over extended periods of time. It is therefore useful in dealing with an executive disorder like ADHD to reduce time delays whenever possible between events in a contingency and to externalize time or create an external reference to time whenever possible as well. By reducing time delays, I mean the following. Think of life as a series of events that comes at you. Those are the E's in life. Then there are the R's, the responses that we prepare in anticipation of the arrival of those events or deadlines. Finally, there are the outcomes, the O's in life. These are the consequences that ensue from what we have done, from the responses that we have prepared or not for the arrival of the future. Now, so long as E's, R's, and O's, events, responses, and outcomes are kept close together, individuals with ADHD will have little difficulty it's sort of like a video game. Things occur very rapidly and the consequences for what you do occur very quickly after the behavior that's involved. So to the extent that the environment can be arranged in this manner with events, responses, and outcomes kept close together, then people with ADHD will have little difficulty dealing with that environment. It's when we start to insert time between these three components of a contingency that problems arise for people with frontal lobe disorders like ADHD. Because the purpose of the frontal lobe is to bind events across time in order to anticipate and prepare for the future. So when we insert time delays between events and responses, or between responses and their consequences, we can disable individuals who have frontal lobe disorders like ADHD. For instance, consider a book report. Generally, book reports are assigned as follows. Johnny, I'd like you to read the book Catcher in the Rye over the next month. Then I would like you to turn in your book report when it is due. It will take me about a week to ten days to grade all of the papers, at which point you will find how you did on your paper. Notice that we've just inserted 30 days between the event and the response that's due, and another week to two weeks between delivering the response, the book report, and the consequences that will ensue. This is a guaranteed disaster for most people with ADHD because they are unable to organize across these time delays in order to prepare for the future. To reduce the, de the delays then, I'd like you to bring the events, responses, and outcomes closer together. So for instance, in the case of the book report, a teacher might have a child with ADHD read several pages from the book each day in school. Then the individual must write several sentences based upon what they have read. And then they are immediately given several tokens, such as 10 tokens in a classroom token system, that they can spend that day on extra privileges in the classroom. Notice that besides reducing the work quota, 
we have brought the event, the response, and the outcome close together in time in the same situation that day. Doing so will help to improve the ability of ADHD children to perform such assignments. Now also don't forget that I said to externalize time, which means to make the passage of time physical in some form. We'll talk about this later as to how to do this, but it's the principle here that's involved. The internal clock that people with ADHD have is not guiding them properly. Therefore, they need an external reference to the passage of time. Now, another key principle is to also make important information physical in the environment. ADHD, as I've said, produces an impairment in executive functioning. And one of the executive functions that is most impaired in ADHD, besides inhibition, is working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold information in mind that is being used to guide behavior or perform a task. People with ADHD have very impaired working memory, which means they can't hold key pieces of information in mind for as long as others. Even when they do, it is immediately shattered by various distractions. So it helps to post key pieces of information at various points of performance in the environment where that information is important in order to guide behavior. So for instance, as we'll see later, teachers can use cards, lists of rules, charts in the front of the classroom, or other means to make rules external and to remind ADHD children of key points of information that they should be following in performing a particular task at that time. I'll have more to say about this later. Another principle to follow is to make motivation physical and external. As I've said, ADHD interferes with executive functioning, and one of the many executive functions is self-motivation the ability to motivate yourself in the absence of external consequences. Children with ADHD cannot do this very well, and so when they are put in situations that do not involve immediate consequences, they are unable to muster the self-motivation and persistence or endurance in order to finish the task. They will usually spend just a few minutes on the task before skipping off to do something that's more interesting. So, you need to make consequences, physical, and external. Again, the point here is the principle. We'll speak later about the various strategies that can be used to meet this principle. But you must make it a win-win for the child. Performing the work in school is a win for the teacher, not for the child, at least not in the short term. So you need to make sure that the child wins something, that is, gets a reward for performing the work that is being requested of them. Now another executive function that ADHD impairs is the ability to mentally manipulate information in order to solve problems. That is the ability to generate various options that one might be able to use to overcome an obstacle or solve a problem related to a task. Therefore, as with the other executive functions, the best way to cope with this deficit is to make it manual or physical, that is to externalize it outside the child. So wherever possible, try and make problem solving manual so that the child can do it with their hands. For example, if there are math problems to be done, let the child have an abacus, a number line, a pile of marbles, or other objects that they can use to count, subtract, add, group, sort, and engage in other mathematical operations in order to facilitate their problem solving of the math assignment. Externalizing problem solving and making it manual can help children who have difficulties with mentally manipulating information and generating multiple possibilities in their head. Now, as I've already implied, ADHD children need to have more immediate, more frequent, and more salient consequences in order to manage their behavior. One of the best ways to increase the salience of consequences or outcomes is to make the child accountable several times a day to others for the work that they have committed to do. This way, the individual is accountable to someone else in the classroom. We know that external accountability increases the likelihood that people will follow through and meet their goals or do the tasks they have agreed to do. Also, there is a need to increase the salience of consequences by using more external and artificial rewards. ADHD children are far less motivated by things such as praise, attention, 
or grades. They are more likely to be motivated by rewards, privileges, and other physical consequences such as token systems that allow them to purchase more motivating and more salient rewards. So keep this in mind when you are trying to design classroom management programs for children with ADHD. Now let's consider some additional principles for classroom management. Besides the ones on the previous slide, I also recommend that you change the rewards periodically so that children do not become bored with the particular rewards or other consequences that you are using. Think of your classroom, and particularly any token system you may be using, like a restaurant. You have to change the menu from time to time if you expect to keep your regular clientele returning to the restaurant and purchasing meals from you. In other words, to keep the customers happy, you have to make things a little more interesting. So change rewards from time to time within the classroom to keep your classroom more motivating to these children. In addition, I encourage teachers to spend less time talking to students, and when they do talk to them, to put your hand on their shoulder or on their hand. Doing so, lightly by the way, gets their attention and also is a sign of intimacy that you wish to say something important and meaningful. And then whatever you wish to say, keep it short, keep it sweet, get to the point. So whether you are delivering an instruction, praise or encouragement, or even a reprimand, make it personal, touch the child, get eye contact, and whatever you say, keep it brief. Get to the point as quickly as possible. Remember, ADHD is not information deficit disorder. Providing more talk, more language, more nattering and reminding is not going to assist with the management of ADHD. So, whatever you wish to say, keep it brief and get their attention. Another way of thinking about this is to act, don't yak. This is a great principle that Sam Goldstein teaches in his workshops for schools. And what this means is to spend more time managing the immediate consequences around the child and structuring the situation to facilitate better performance. In other words, act to change the situation and you will manage behavior as opposed to simply nattering and yakking and talking to the child about their misbehavior or about what needs to be done. More talk, as I've said, will not change the problem. So act to manage the situation. Act quickly and you will have more control over ADHD children than you will if you just talk at them. It is also helpful in dealing with anyone with a disability to maintain your sense of humor because these individuals are going to be much more likely to make mistakes in situations. And if one takes those mistakes seriously and starts viewing them as intentional, one could develop a very vindictive mindset toward people with ADHD. So it helps to understand that the individual is not trying to get you upset. They're not doing this intentionally. They have a disability, and it will lead them to make more mistakes than other individuals. Therefore, one needs to maintain a certain sense of humor about these mistakes. Do so, and you will find that you are able to keep a much better attitude toward disabled youngsters like those with ADHD. Now, ADHD children are punished far more often at home and in school than our other children. As a result, I do not recommend that we begin a behavior management program by simply adding more punishment into the situation. After all, the excessive punishment that's already being used clearly isn't working, and therefore adding more punishment is unlikely to change the situation to any great extent. Instead, I recommend that you begin with reward programs that you increase the amount of praise, attention, respect, encouragement, as well as privileges and other more physical rewards around the child for appropriate behavior. Do this first for several weeks before you even think about introducing punishment or discipline. If you do so, you will increase the available incentives in the environment for the behavior you wish to generate in the child, and then when you engage in selective, mild discipline, it will be much more effective at discouraging the inappropriate behavior, and that is because there is already ample incentives in the environment to guide the child toward the more appropriate behavior that you desire. Remember, one of the keys to punishment has to do with the amount of incentives and rewards available in that situation for the opposite and appropriate prosocial behavior 
that you are trying to encourage. If you increase incentives, you encourage the child to behave well, and then when punishment is necessary for misbehavior, it is more likely to be effective. Now another principle I'd like to encourage teachers to use in school is to anticipate problem situations and set up a plan in advance for those situations. After all, you see this child every day. You clearly have a good sense of what situations are likely to pose problems for this child. Once you understand what those situations are, you can restructure those situations in advance in order to decrease the likelihood of misbehavior and to increase the likelihood that the child will behave more effectively in that situation. We're going to talk about this kind of transition planning later in this course. But make a plan and implement the plan, and that way you will be engaging in proactive teaching rather than just reactive teaching. Maintain a sense of priorities in your classroom. A lot of times many of the commands that teachers give to students have very low priorities, which is to say they're not especially important. So instead, focus on the things that matter in school. These things have to do usually with getting the work done, getting along with others well, and following teachers' instructions. Focus on these three things and don't worry so much about the minor or petty inconveniences or minor mistakes and trivial misbehavior that may be going on. By encouraging effective performance of educational work, especially productivity, by encouraging the child's adoption of more pro-social social skills with other children, and by encouraging children to follow teacher commands when they are given, one finds that you focus on the priorities and you are likely to get far more improvement in an ADHD child's behavior than you would if you simply paid attention to a lot of the petty misbehavior and inconveniences that may exist in the classroom. Keep a sense of priorities and focus on those first. I also encourage teachers to do what we taught parents to do, practice forgiveness. Disabled people make mistakes. Even teachers make mistakes. And parents of these students make mistakes as well. Making mistakes is part of the human condition. As has been said by others, it's why we put erasers on pencils. Therefore, understand that mistakes will happen, and don't get so upset when they do. Just strive to change the situation next time so that the mistake is less likely to happen. In other words, try to get it right the next time. That's what's important in life and in managing ADHD children, not whether or not mistakes happened. So, get good at forgiving children the mistakes they make, and then redesign the situation to try to discourage those mistakes from happening again. Forgive yourself for making mistakes. You're not going to be perfect in dealing with ADHD children. You won't always get it right, but try to get it right the next time. Finally, don't blame parents so much. It's very common in the U.S. to engage in parent bashing around many children's problems at home and in school. Yet, as I've said, ADHD has nothing to do with parenting. ADHD is a neurological and genetic disorder. Consequently, what the parents are doing has little impact on this child's behavior. That is to say, they didn't cause this problem. So, cut them some slack, give them a break, and don't be so judgmental about what these parents may or may not be doing in the home environment around this child. Instead, I encourage you to forgive parents the simple mistakes they too are likely to make in trying to raise this disabled youngster. Finally, I would like teachers to remember that one of the most effective treatments for ADHD, besides the various principles that I've covered above, is medication. There are many medications on the market for ADHD that are quite effective. These medications produce nearly twice as much change and improve the behavior of more than twice as many children as do behavior modification and other psychosocial interventions. It has been my experience that between 70 and 80 percent or more of ADHD children will require medication at some point during their educational program in order to effectively perform in that environment. So if necessary, you may need to refer families to physicians for more information about medications. You can also take my course on this website with regard to ADHD medications to learn more about them. Now let's get into some details of classroom management. 
I want to begin with what I consider to be some of the basic considerations for structuring the curriculum and the classroom in order to facilitate better behavior and more effective academic performance in ADHD children. In 1991, the U.S. Department of Education surveyed all public schools in the United States for what they were doing to deal with ADHD children. They then went out and visited a number of these schools that they felt were doing an extraordinary job in managing ADHD children in their school districts. After visiting these schools, they wrote up a manual called Best Practices in Public Schools for ADHD Children. Now, while this manual is out of print, many copies of this manual were made. Indeed, every school district was provided with one of these manuals, along with videotapes. See if you could find it somewhere in your school district. It is loaded with lots of good suggestions for dealing with ADHD children. One of the best suggestions that was found uh, in this manual that was going on in several public schools in the U.S., such as in Lexington, Kentucky, as well as in Louisville, and I believe also in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and elsewhere, was schools developing an ADHD liaison. The ADHD liaison is a teacher with a number of years' experience in dealing with behavioral and emotionally disturbed, as well as learning disabled children. Think of this person as a master teacher. This person was given additional training in ADHD, such as through the courses that you might find on this website, making them more of an expert in the disorder. And then this teacher was given two responsibilities. In exchange for adopting these responsibilities, their teaching time was reduced. The first responsibility is they served as a consultant to all other teachers in that school building with regard to managing ADHD in school. Whenever a teacher of an ADHD youngster was having difficulty, they could page this teacher or leave a note for them, and that teacher would come by sometime that day to learn more about the problem and to give suggestions to the teacher about how they might deal with it. This is a very inexpensive means of dealing, initially, with these behavioral difficulties. It's often referred to as pre-referral intervention, meaning before you refer the child for expensive, multidisciplinary evaluations, team meetings, development of IEPs, and provision of other formal special educational services, understand that sometimes these behavior problems can be nipped in the bud very quickly by just having a consultant at school advise younger or less experienced teachers on appropriate management methods that might be used to deal with the specific problem they're having. Now the second responsibility that falls to the liaison is that any parents that have an ADHD child at that school can call this teacher for assistance with problems they think the child might be having in that environment. This is sort of like a patient representative in a hospital. If you were in a hospital and you didn't like the care you were receiving from the hospital staff, you could pick up the phone and call the patient representative's office. That representative is an advocate for you. It is their job to interact with the bureaucracy, find out what is going on, and try to meet with you and resolve the problem to your satisfaction. So the teacher liaison serves in a similar capacity in the school. Families of ADHD children, if they think there's a problem at school or they have concerns or they just want to know more about how their child is doing, contact the liaison first. They don't go around calling all of the child's teachers and interfering with the school day. Just call the liaison. Tell the liaison what you're interested in. They will then go and meet with the various teachers, collect the information, and call you back. They may also be able to give you some idea by then of what they may propose to do about any particular problem the child is having in the school. So, schools might consider adopting the ADHD liaison model to increase parent satisfaction with the school, to increase ADHD children's success within the school, and to decrease the likelihood that parents may sue the school over malperformance in the educational environment. Now another, I, I think, key principle or basic consideration is to not use grade retention as an intervention for children in school. There is an ample literature on grade retention and its consequences. Generally, it indicates that there are few, if any, benefits from grade retention. What little there are appear to be a short-term boost in academic achievement scores. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that you now have an older child that you're comparing to same grade 
norms in scoring up the test. Even these benefits, artificial as they are, are not long-lasting, and many children do not even get those benefits. Research indicates instead that many children experience harm or psychological injury as a consequence of being retained in school, and the earlier the retention, the more likely these harms to occur. For instance, boys tend to become more aggressive. Girls tend to become more depressed in the year of their retention. Both boys and girls lose motivation to learn in school. You may also see peer rejection increase because few children wish to hang around with a child who has now been retained back at an earlier grade. Finally, and most importantly, research indicates that children who have been retained in grade are much more likely to drop out of school than children who had the same kinds of problems but who were dealt with more effectively and who weren't retained in school. So, let's stop using grade retention as an intervention. After all, the intervention failed one year. Why would you wish to repeat a failed intervention for another year? It makes absolutely no sense. I also like to recommend that teachers spend less time at the beginning of the academic year teaching from their lesson plan, that is the curriculum, and spend more time focusing on establishing behavioral control of their classroom. I'm not saying don't teach, I'm simply saying increase an emphasis on the rules of the classroom and the consequences you will use immediately to deal with various behavioral difficulties, as well as spend time on increasing the amount of incentives and rewards in the classroom. And then you can also teach at the same time. But put greater emphasis during the first week or two of school on establishing control of behavior in the classroom. And then you will be able to teach at a much more rapid pace and children will understand your rules and the fact that you have credibility as a behavior manager. And then you will be able to teach much more effectively. Now ADHD children have a disability. As I've said in my other courses on executive functioning on this website, children with ADHD are delayed in the development of self-control and executive abilities. It is my estimate that they are at least 30% behind other children in executive functioning and self-control. And so I've developed what I call the 30% rule that I discussed in the parent counseling course on this website. The 30% rule says that if you wish to know where an ADHD child is functioning, reduce their age by about 30%. That is the level of persistence, self-control, rule following, and self-organization that this child has. And so you need to alter the environment and the curriculum to fit with this child's executive age rather than demanding that they behave normally like other children who are developing normally in their self-control. One way to address the 30% rule is to simply reduce the quantity of work that you give to this child. After all, it isn't necessary for children to do a lot of the work that has been assigned to them. A teacher can determine if a child has learned a particular rule, strategy, or concept in some academic subject through fewer problems. So assign only enough problems to see whether or not the child has gotten the idea. Uh, and then you can move on. It isn't necessary for this child to do as much work as other children. Or, if you believe it is necessary for children to do a certain number of problems, then I encourage you to break the workload down into small quotas. That is to say, give smaller amounts of work at a time with frequent rest breaks in between. For example, if you're giving children in the classroom 30 math problems to do, then take a pair of scissors cut off the top five problems at the top of the page and give the ADHD child just five problems to do. When they finish those five problems, they can get up, come to you, give you the assignment, and you can take the scissors and cut off another row of five problems to give to them. They now go back to their desk and do those five problems. It's a lot easier for ADHD children to accomplish the assignment in this approach using small quotas with frequent breaks than it is to overwhelm them with 30 problems at a time and then they're not going to get through more than the first five before they're off task distracted and no longer accomplishing the work. I also encourage teachers to arrange their classrooms in the traditional manner with rows of desks that face forward to the teaching area. Do not arrange children at circular desks in which many children share a desk and have the opportunity to look at each other and maybe even talk with each other while you're trying to teach. 
Such modular classrooms and circular desk arrangements have proven to be disasters for ADHD children being able to pay attention to the teacher. So follow the traditional desk arrangement and also have the child sit in one of the front rows near the teaching area. This allows you to interact with, monitor, supervise, and provide consequences to the ADHD child much more often while you're teaching than if this child were placed toward the back of the classroom. Now other considerations for teachers involve targeting productivity first. ADHD children do not have as much problem with the accuracy or correctness of the work they do as much as they have with simply getting work done. Their problem is in producing work, that is the amount of work done in a given period of time, not in how correct the work is. Research shows that ADHD children are only about 10% less accurate in the work that they accomplish. Their biggest problem is that they just don't do much work. That's a productivity issue. So I encourage teachers to focus on production and not grade papers to begin with. In other words, I want you to reward the child for every problem they attempt, whether it's right or wrong. And then once you have increased the child's production of work, then you can begin to look at whether or not the problems are being done accurately. Often they are. But if they're not, you can still wait to deal with the issue of accuracy and deal with the production problem first, because that is typically the most important difficulty they have. I also encourage teachers not to send unfinished classwork home. Parents of ADHD children already have enough problems at home getting children to do the typical chores and follow the rules and get along with siblings and others at home. Adding more work at home simply pours more fuel on this fire. Also, the point of performance for academic work is in school. And as you heard in my lecture on executive functioning, that is where the intervention must take place. The point of performance is the natural setting where the problems are occurring. And if you wish to deal with those problems, that is where you must intervene and not kick the can down the road or punt the problem to some other individual to deal with. So if a child is not finishing their classwork, the solution to that problem is in that classroom not on the backs of parents who are already overworked and overstressed at home. So, if you have a problem getting classwork done, then consider how you might modify the classroom in order to improve that problem. There are more than 80 recommendations on the, or in this course for how to address this problem of classwork. But don't address it by sending it home to parents. It's not their responsibility, after all, to see that classwork gets done. Think of it this way. If it's all right for teachers to send their unfinished work home to parents to be done, then why isn't it okay for parents to do likewise? For instance, can't parents send their dirty laundry to school on Monday to have the teacher do the laundry for them because they didn't get around to doing it over the weekend? Or how about sending the child's rabbit cage to school to be cleaned out by the teacher because the child did not finish all the chores they were supposed to do over the weekend? It's rather silly, isn't it, when you think about it? But in general, if it's all right for teachers to punt their responsibilities to a parent, then the reverse ought to be true as well. But that, of course, reveals how ridiculous the situation is. So I recommend, therefore, that teachers not send unfinished classwork home. And if they do, I encourage parents to refuse to do it. This is a teacher's responsibility. After all, they're being paid to get this work done. And the way to solve the problem is in the classroom using the methods you're learning in this course. Now, if homework is to be given, and by the way, I wasn't discussing homework above, that's a different subject, but if homework is to be given, I encourage teachers to give it out in week-long assignments. In other words, each Monday, send home a page that indicates what the assignments are going to be each night in that class this week, so that parents know what's coming at them and can reorganize family life to address these homework assignments. Don't surprise parents on a Tuesday night with a major art project due the next day when Tuesday night happens to be the Cub Scout meeting night and they're going to be busy with this child doing other things. Show a little respect and let the parents know in advance what you plan for them to do with this child and they will be better prepared to do it and support what you are doing at school. Now another means of dealing with homework is to simply eliminate it. 
There is little, if any, research to show that homework during elementary school benefits the academic achievement of any children. Indeed, the research shows that it often produces no benefits. Schools that don't give homework have children who perform just as well in academic achievement tests as do schools that give homework. As you know, in the U.S., we have increasingly emphasized homework in our public schools in the belief that if a little is good, more must be better. But this has turned out not to be true. As you see here, the overall relationship between the amount of homework given and a child's academic achievement is a correlation of just 0.15 to 0.25. Trivial. And this applies across all grades, and especially so in the elementary grades, where we see these weak correlations. By high school, we begin to see some impact of homework on academic achievement. Research reviews indicate that the optimal amount of homework in total for an adolescent in high school should be between one and a half and two and a half hours per night. More hours of homework does not produce additional benefits for individuals. So the gist of this is that I believe that schools should cut back if not eliminate homework in the elementary grades and then start to increase it gradually as children move into the middle school and then by high school use the optimum range of homework as you see here on this line on my slide about one and a half to two and a half hours per night. Now, speaking of homework, parents will often ask you whether it's all right for children to study listening to music. Research by Howard Abakoff actually addressed this question. Children were allowed to do homework in this study with no music, they were allowed to choose their music, or they were allowed to listen to classical music. And it was found in this study that children who were allowed to choose the music they like and to listen to it got more work done during their homework than children who did not listen to music or who listened to music that they didn't care for. So while music might result in greater distractibility or deterioration of homework performance in normal children, it actually appears to be beneficial to ADHD children, probably because ADHD children often find homework situations to be relatively unstimulating or boring. And we've known since Sidney Zental's work in the 1980s that in boring environments, ADHD children increase their distractibility and hyperactivity as a form of self-stimulation to make up for the low level of stimulation they appear to be subjectively experiencing in that situation. So, one way to address that is to mildly increase the amount of background stimulation in particular environments, and you may find that ADHD children are better able to concentrate and to perform their work in that environment. At the bottom of the slide, you can see the reference with regard to schoolwork and particularly homework. This is the review by Cooper and colleagues in the Review of Educational Research on Homework. Here is also the reference that deals with uh, noise improving uh, children's work performance, that is to say music rather. Now another useful approach in classroom management is to let children teach each other. Research shows that children are more sensitive to the influence of their peers than to, influence, than to the influences of adults, particularly teachers. This influence of peers, as you know, increases with age. Therefore, why not take advantage of this effect? Have children teach each other. You may find that they are more likely to pay attention to what a peer is trying to teach them than they are to what a teacher is trying to teach them. On this slide, you see a list of the tactics that teachers can use for peer tutoring. First of all, create and distribute the worksheets that you wish the children to do, often called scripts. Then the teacher, for a few minutes, can review the work that is to be done and teach any new concepts or skills that are needed to do that work. Then the classroom is divided up into pairs. And one of the members of the pairs is appointed as the tutor and the other as the student. And so the student tutor now teaches or quizzes the other student on the material. Uh, and then, at the end of the day or at the end of the week, you can reassign individuals to different tu uh, tutors and different students so that you don't have individuals staying with each other for more than a day or two or at most a week at a time. So reorganize the dyads periodically. Within the dyad, the 
tutor and the student can alternate roles in teaching each other the particular academic assignments that are at hand. So, one student may be the tutor for one kind of assignment, and then when we move to a different kind of academic subject, they reverse their roles, and now the student becomes the tutor, and vice versa. And then I also encourage teachers to graph the results of the work that is being done. Uh, that is to have graphs at the front of the classroom for each dyad so that they can post their productivity on the graphs. And if quizzes are being given, the results of these quizzes can also be posted as well so that other children can see how they're doing in competing with the other dyads in the classroom. For more on peer tutoring, you can see George DuPaul and Gary Stoner's book on ADHD in the schools. Now let's look at some other classroom management methods that might be useful for teachers to employ with ADHD children. One is simply to allow a little, a little more restlessness while the child is engaged in work. If the child wants to stand, sit on their knees, fidget, or otherwise just walk around their desk briefly and then sit down again, allow this to happen. Research shows that ADHD children that are allowed to be more active while they're working get more work done than children that are required to sit still. Also, as I've already said, give frequent exercise breaks to children. Break the work into small quotas and then periodically let them stand up, stretch, move about, and then come back and do more work. This kind of physical movement seems to help ADHD children cope with their symptoms. There are various devices that teachers can employ for helping to organize children, such as trapper keepers, color-coded binders, and other ways of organi organizing workbooks, desks, and homework. And I encourage teachers to use these more structured methods to helping to organize the ADHD child and their materials and assignments. Now, when I was designing and working with schools in Worcester, Massachusetts for five years under a federal grant, where we designed early intervention programs in schools for ADHD children, one of the more effective strategies we found to be useful was to make the child part of the teaching assignment itself. We called it participatory teaching. For instance, if a teacher was going to review a poem in class, then the ADHD child was given the pointer and was asked to stand near the teacher and to point at the various lines in the poem as the teacher discussed them. This allowed the child to move during the lesson plan but it also made them part of the lesson so that they could focus their attention better on what the teacher was teaching. This not only reduced behavior problems, but it improved the likelihood that the ADHD child from benefit would benefit from that particular uh, set of instructions. So there are various ways of including the ADHD child in the lesson and having them assist you with teaching the lesson so that they can be more active during that time in school. Now, if you want children to practice fluency, that is to rehearse a skill over and over again in order to make it more automatic or reflexive, for instance, perhaps you've taught a particular mathematical operation like addition and subtraction, and you want the child to rehearse this over multiple problems so that it becomes automatic for them. It is better to do this using computers and educational software with ADHD children than to do it using simply mimeograph sheets of paper. Computer software programs are more entertaining, more stimulating, and provide more immediate feedback for individuals than does a mimeograph sheet of paper. And all of those, as you've gathered from my 18 principles at the start of this lecture, are ways to improve the performance of ADHD children through more frequent, more immediate, and more salient consequences, and by reducing the time delays in the components of the assignment. So, where possible, use computers and software to rehearse academic skills. Now I know that teachers like to turn their classrooms into game shows from time to time where they ask questions and have the children race to raise their hands and then the teacher calls on one of the first students to get their hands up and tell them the answer. This is a rather traditional approach to teaching. But for children that are already impulsive it can be problematic. So rather than encouraging impulsiveness I would prefer that teachers adopt a strategy that was used in a research project more than a decade ago and found to be quite successful. This involves giving each student in the classroom a laminated whiteboard or work slate and whenever a question is asked every student writes the answer down on their slate 
and then they hold up their workboard so that the teacher can see it. The teacher does not call on anyone until all hands are in the air, and then she scans the rows to see the answers the children have. She does this in order to find out who got the answer wrong, and then she'll make a mental note that she may need to work with the student on this particular question or academic subject uh, in order to correct that problem. But give everybody a chance to show you what they know and what they've learned. And then the teacher can call one of the students up to the front of the class to explain to the class how they got the particular answer to that problem. But don't reward children for coming up with answers quickly. Let all children answer the problem or the question, and that allows you to see who's getting it right and who isn't. But don't reward impulsiveness. Finally, teachers can encourage peer tutoring outside of school, what I call the study buddy approach. Let children do their homework together with other students in the neighborhood who may be in your classroom. Now, obviously, this can't be done every day, but it could be done once or twice a week where children are encouraged to study with a peer. Again, peer influence is more influential than is teacher influence, and so studying with peers may be a better way of teaching and getting work done outside of school, not just in school. Now another suggestion for helping to improve ADHD symptoms in the classroom is to intersperse low and high appealing activities. In other words, alternate between fun and boring activities and don't try to stack up all the boring stuff back to back in the classroom that children have to do. By breaking up the classroom activities based upon their appealing nature and alternating and interspersing high appeal with low appeal activities, you'll find that ADHD children are more likely to attend to the work that they're being asked to do. Teachers can also be more animated and theatrical in teaching with ADHD students. Speak louder, move more, and be more emotional and animated, that is more positively emotional, in how you teach. Also, as we've already said, when you have to give the child an instruction, a rule, a command, or a reprimand, or even if it's just praising them, go to the child, in other words, personalize it, touch them on the shoulder or on the arm or hand, and then briefly say what you want to say. As I've said earlier, touch more, talk less, and you'll find that ADHD children are more likely to listen to what you have to say. Now, if ADHD children are not on medication, then you want to get the more difficult subjects into the morning hours, that is, the more demanding subjects that demand more persistence and organization and self-regulation more generally. That is because the morning hours for ADHD children are better than the midday or afternoon hours. Research shows that ADHD children deteriorate markedly across the day in their powers of executive functioning and concentration and so it pays to put the more challenging subjects earlier in the day rather than later in the day. Now this point is moot if a child is on medication because the medication serves to correct for this problem. Keep in mind, however, that with adolescents the reverse may be true. As you know, by puberty we often find that adolescents' period of peak performance is midday to late afternoon rather than in the morning hours. And so for high school students, it may be better to reverse this sequence. That is, if they're off medication, you might want to put the more demanding subjects after the lunch period rather than before the lunch period to place it at a time when they are more likely to be able to concentrate and self-organize. If you're looking for good instructional materials or curriculum materials to use in your classroom, consider those that are highly structured, known as programmed learning, or DISTAR, Direct Instruction Curriculum Programs. These highly structured materials present various assignments in short quotas and then quiz the student for whether they've learned that particular lesson before moving on to the next stage of instruction. So look for highly regimented program learning materials because ADHD children seem to do better under such highly structured curriculum. Now you might find it useful to have the child choose the initial work goal when you want them to do work at their desk. In other words, you can show the child the worksheet and say, how many of these problems do you think you might get done in the next 10 minutes? Let the child give an answer, such as 5 or 10 problems, 
and then that's the beginning goal. Research shows that people are more likely to do a goal that they have chosen rather than to do one imposed on them by another individual. That doesn't mean that you can't ask them to do more work, but start by asking them how much work they think they can do, and then let them try that first before you decide to add additional work into their assignment. Now ADHD children have difficulties with handwriting. This is part of the motor coordination problem that goes with ADHD. So I'm not suggesting that you stop teaching handwriting, but I am suggesting that you de-emphasize it somewhat in getting assignments done, and instead focus on training children in typing skills, or what is now called keyboarding, because children will be using computers more and more in the future for getting work done, and are less likely to be using written assignments, that is to say, handwritten assignments. And so we would encourage you to let ADHD children le learn keyboarding quickly and to use typing as an alternative form of written expression than handwriting when assignments have to be done, or at least teach them in parallel so that the ADHD child has another means of expressing what they know through written means using computers and keyboards rather than exclusively relying on handwriting. Also, we encourage you to give after-school help sessions to ADHD children. If you're going to be staying after school grading papers, encourage the ADHD child to stay after school once or twice a week and do their homework while you are in the classroom. That way, if the child has problems, they can come up and ask you questions that they might have. Or if you already know the child is having difficulty learning this material, you can provide them with some additional assistance during these after-school hours. You can also encourage parents to hire tutors to work with their children outside of school if the child is struggling with particular academic assignments or an academic subject. And don't forget, of course, there are books on tape, videos, and other supplemental materials that can be used to teach academic material besides simply doing written assignments or reading textbooks. Now I mentioned already that ADHD children have difficulties with working memory. That is to say they can't hold things in mind for as long as other individuals. And this is why we find that they have very impaired reading comprehension, listening comprehension, and viewing comprehension. That is to say that when they have to read material, for instance, we often find that as they read, they forget what they've just read at the top of the page. And so they have to go back to the top of the page again and reread it in order to get that information again. And they may have to do this several times before finishing the page. Even then, they're likely to not get out of that page as much information as other students are likely to do. One way of compensating for this working memory problem is to encourage ADHD students to always be taking notes when you're talking or when they're reading so that their hand should always be moving on a, a writing tablet or sheet of paper in which they're writing down brief notes, phrases, or even just drawing simple diagrams or hieroglyphs to help them remember what it is they are reading. Continuous note-taking allows the paper that they're writing on to substitute for their working memory, and therefore they're much more likely to get information out of the assignment, to not have to keep rereading or re-listening to the assignments, and therefore they're more likely to be able to respond to your questions appropriately using the worksheets that they've created from their reading or from listening to your lectures or to the videos that you may be showing in school. So encourage continuous note-taking whenever comprehension of material is important. Another approach to dealing with behavioral problems of ADHD children in school as I've already su suggested, is to increase the incentives in the environment for appropriate behavior. Therefore, when inappropriate behavior occurs and it's punished, that punishment is more effective. The rewards, of course, encourage the, the adoption by the child of more appropriate forms of behavior in their own right. So, one way to do this is to increase the amount of praise, approval, appreciation, respect and encouragement that teachers provide to ADHD children. I often refer to this as becoming a one-minute manager. The One-Minute Manager was a very popular business management book published back in the 1970s that remained a bestseller for many years. In this book, supervisors were encouraged to improve morale and productivity in the workplace by leaving their offices frequently 
and monitoring the activities of other workers. But it wasn't just monitoring them. What they would do is to spend one minute with various employees, noticing what they were doing, commenting on it in a respectful and approving way, and generally having a positive but brief interaction with the employees. People found that they were much more respected, listened to, and appreciated in those work environments, and therefore they were more productive for these managers. So I encourage teachers to ad adopt this one-minute manager philosophy, circulate among their students frequently in the classroom, spend just a brief period of time with each of them, uh, and notice what they're doing, make some comments about it, be encouraging, praising, and if necessary, even give an occasional reward to a child, particularly a child with ADHD, in order to improve productivity. You can also increase incentives by adopting various point systems, token systems, or other artificial reward programs in order to boost the praise and appreciation that you're already giving to these children. These tokens or points can then be cashed in at various times in the day for access to games, toys, and other privileges in the class environment. Now, to increase the availability of such material or artificial rewards, I encourage teachers to send a memo home to parents from time to time, asking them if they would clean out their toy closets at home and send to school any toys that the child is no longer using that they ordinarily might have donated to Goodwill or simply thrown into the trash. By this means, teachers can accumulate a great deal of games that other children might be interested in playing with, or toys, for instance, such as video games, even if one child has grown bored of them and no longer wishes to play with those activities. I know teachers say that they often don't have money in order to be able to buy these privileges and rewards, but by asking parents to donate them, this becomes an alternative means of filling the classroom with desirable activities that can be used as part of a token system, uh, rather than the teacher having to spend their own money out of pocket. Also, you can group your classroom into teams of students, in which four or five students form a team, and they do the assignments as a team. This way, students are able to keep the ADHD student in their team on task more often. Again, as I mentioned, ADHD students are more influenced by peers than they are by teachers, and this again is another means of using peer influence to try to help manage the ADHD student. Now, at the end of each day, or at the end of each week, the teams can be reorganized into new teams uh, so that the ADHD student is not burdening one team exceptionally, uh, or that is, for any prolonged period of time. Another way to increase incentives in the classroom is to use a variable interval reinforcement schedule for rewarding children while they're working at their desk. I call this the tone tape. This is something that I invented back in 1976, I believe it was, when I was an intern at the Oregon Health Sciences Center, and as part of my requirements, I was uh, encouraged to develop a classroom with other interns for ADHD students. In this classroom, we set up this variable interval schedule of rewards, and we did it by using a tape player, and on the tape we had recorded various tones, bells, or signals, but these were in random order. Now in the first tape that we created, the tones occurred in very short intervals, but they were variable and unpredictable. So for instance, a bell might ring now, and then five seconds later, and then in a minute, and then two seconds, and then twenty seconds, so that the intervals between the tones are quite variable. Nevertheless, they're short. And so there were frequent tones on the tape. Now how do you use this? When children have work to do at their desk, you can get out the tape player, or these days you're probably using a digital recorder of some sort, and you can put in the tape or the recording, and you tell the students that while they're working, they're going to hear a tone, or a bell ring, or whatever uh, sound you've used to create the tape. And you tell them that whenever they hear that note or tone, if they are on task, they get to give themselves a point. If they are off task or not working, they must subtract a point. Now the teacher gives each student a card on which to mark their points, 
usually the card is divided into two columns with a plus on the left column and a minus at the top of the right column and this is where they record their plus and minus points then the teacher says okay begin your work and turns on the tape recorder or tape player or digital player now the tones begin to occur and children start to record their points if they were working now the teacher sits at the front of the classroom and monitors the class for any potential cheating it's relatively easy to see where the children are placing their marks uh, and if a child is incorrectly recording a mark for instance they were off task but they're giving themselves a point anyway then the teacher can correct them for this we found that on task behavior and work accomplishment rose to 96 percent during the first week we used this variable interval tone tape it's sort of like turning work performance into a slot machine you never know when the next bell or tone is going to sound and so the ideal strategy is to keep working all the time and therefore you maximize the number of points you're likely to earn now in the second week you can record another tape that has tones that are spaced further apart and so there will be fewer tones on this tape what you're doing is stretching the interval between the tones to some extent when you do this make sure that you double the number of points that students are allowed to give themselves because you have removed a certain number of opportunities for reward by stretching out the intervals now use this for a week and then create a third tape or recording that has even fewer tones on it even further apart so notice you're sort of using a shaping procedure here where each week you are stretching out the intervals between the tones which is between the rewards uh, you're still keeping them unpredictable and variable but as you stretch out the intervals fewer tones occur which means that there's fewer opportunities to earn points so you have to double the value of the points whenever you do each new week of playing these tone recordings or tapes. Try it. See how well it works for you. We found that it was a very beneficial strategy for our ADHD children. In fact, after the third week, we simply eliminated the tone tape altogether and went straight to our typical classroom token system where children were rewarded uh, at the end of their work for how many problems they had gotten done. Now, if you don't want to make this recording, I understand that you can buy a version of these tapes at the addwarehouse.com. Regardless of whatever system you use for rewarding children in the classroom, it is beneficial to allow them to exchange their points or tokens several times a day in order to have access to the rewards and privileges. Don't make them accumulate their points over several days or even over an entire school week before allowing them to cash in their points to get privileges. The younger the child, the more frequently they have to exchange their points in order for those points to be valuable to them. Now, of course, with older children, they can delay having access to the rewards for longer periods of time. But even for older students, I still encourage teachers to allow access at least once a day or more often to these rewards when the students can exchange their points for these privileges. Now, no matter what reward system you're using, teachers should be encouraged to keep their reward to punishment ratio in at least a two to one balance. That is, they should always be giving at least twice as many rewards, incentives, tokens, and other privileges as they are taking away in forms of punishment or discipline. This keeps, or this ensures that the program remains a positive, encouraging, incentive-based program rather than a disciplinary program. Now, I'm not referring here to children cashing in their points for rewards. I'm referring here, when I mean punishment, to docking the children points for misbehavior. That is a disciplinary strategy I'll talk about in a moment. But what I'm saying here is you always want to be giving away twice as many points as rewards as you are taking away as punishment, so that the program remains a positive program. If it reverses and it becomes predominantly punitive, children are no longer interested in participating in the program and will not consider the points or rewards you are giving them to be especially valuable. One very easy means of encouraging or increasing incentives at school and providing more rewards to children for how well they work 
is to use a daily behavior report card. Let me show you one on the next slide. Here you see a report card that I designed using Word and using the table function in Word to create a matrix. In this matrix along the left hand column you can create uh, openings here for rules that you want the child to obey. You'll notice that I've created uh, a series of rules here, class participation, performs work, follows class rules, and so on in the left hand column. Now across the top are columns for each subject that the child has. And so we have reading, math, spelling, and so on in the sequence that the child normally goes through that school day. This allows each teacher to evaluate the child in their subject and rate that child as to how well they did in the five rules that you see on the left hand side of the card. Now the rating system that I usually use you can see at the top of the slide. At the top you see a series of numbers such as over here one is excellent, two is good, three is fair, four is poor, and five is terrible. These are the numbers that the teachers are to use as they fill in the card for their column. So at the end of the class evaluate the child using the numbers 1 to 5 as to how well they did in each of these areas of class behavior and then initial it at the bottom under your column to protect against a forgery. Then the card goes to the next teacher and that teacher fills out their column and so on across the school day using the numbers at the top of the card. Now at the end of the day the card is sent home and parents ask for the card. They then review the numbers that are on the card discussing the positive numbers first with the child as to how things went and why it went so well and then if there are any negative numbers such as fours and fives on the card discuss those and then come up with a plan that the child might do the next day for helping to deal with that problem. Be sure to remind the child the next morning as they leave for school about the plan that they have agreed to follow in that subject in order to address the problem. After this discussion, parents are to convert the numbers on the card into points, and the conversions are seen at the top here in parentheses. For instance, every one on the card is worth 25 points, every two on the card is worth 15 points, and so on. Notice that fours and fives are not good ratings, and they result in removal of points or a fine. A 4, for instance, is a negative 15 points and a 5 is negative 25. So the parents now add up all of the points that the child has earned, subtract the negative points or the fines. The balance is what the child has to spend in a home point system that the parents have set up. So obviously parents need to set up a home token economy uh, in order for children to spend these points on various home privileges and rewards that the parents will arrange. What this card serves to do is to connect school behavior with more important consequences at home that may be more motivating to the child. It also provides a means for parents to know more precisely how the school day has gone for this child. And if the child is required to write their homework assignments on the back of the card, it also serves as a homework assignment sheet. So I encourage teachers to use this card system in order to connect school behavior to home consequences and in order to keep parents more informed about how their child is performing in school that day. You can also use this card, by the way, for monitoring medication trials so that you can see whether or not the medication is able to control the child's behavior across the entire school day. And therefore, the cards can be shared with physicians who can then evaluate the card to see whether or not dosage adjustments or adjustments to the timing of the dosing need to be made to help this child better behave in school. Another means of doing this sort of monitoring of children, besides using a card system like I do, is a program called Pay Attention, Stop, Think, and Listen that was developed by Linda Bowman. You can find this program at the addwarehouse.com. One of its advantages is that not, it not only provides for teachers doing the evaluation of the children, but as you see in the paragraph here, it also encourages children to self-monitor and self-evaluate their own performance as well. I believe this may be a very useful strategy for teachers to use with ADHD students in the classroom. Yet another means 
for helping ADHD students and increasing incentives in the school is to use a device like this one known as the Attention Training System, originally invented by Mark Rapport, now at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, but commercially um, produced and marketed now by Gordon Systems out of Syracuse, New York. With this device, you have a box that you see here. This box sits on the child's desk. The face of the box has a numerical counter on it, and this box is going to dispense a point a minute for working. Now, over here on the left is a transmitter that the teacher carries in her or his pocket. You see four keys on the transmitter. That means that a teacher could actually use four different boxes with four different students in that classroom. Now here is how it works. Whenever the child is working at their desk, the teacher turns on the box, there's an on-off switch on the back, and the box starts to reward the child a point a minute, and it's going to do this automatically. But the teacher at the front of the classroom is now monitoring this student, and if she sees the student looking away, distracted, or engaged in other off-task behavior, she simply pushes the button for that student's monitor or box. When she pushes the button, this light flashes red, a tone sounds, and a point is subtracted off the counter. So essentially the box is providing automatic rewards, but the teacher is doing the punishing or fining. We have found this device to be especially helpful for ADHD students, and it only needs to be used a couple of weeks to train up on-task work-related behavior, and then it can be removed or used with another child as the teacher goes back to using uh, a more convenient token system in the classroom. Yet another device I have found to be helpful, particularly for, with middle school and high school students, is the WatchMinder. This is a digital watch, but it is programmable, and you can record into the watch at the beginning of each school week particular reminders for the student that will appear on the device at particular times throughout the day. Indeed, parents could help to program this every morning if they knew what was coming up in the child's school day. Or teachers can use the device at school and program it for particular deadlines that are coming up that day. Nevertheless, the watch serves not only as a timekeeping device, but also as a way of reminding individuals about particular deadlines, assignments, or other important events that are coming up that day that they need to be reminded about. I mentioned earlier in talking about classroom management principles, those 18 great ideas on my first slide, that one of the principles is to anticipate problem situations and then to have a plan in place when the problem setting arises. This type of proactive teaching is likely to reduce behavior problems markedly in their likelihood of occurrence. So, what is a transition plan? It would go something like this. When a child enters a particular activity, for instance when they come into your classroom, or when you're transitioning from one type of academic subject to another, such as from math to reading, or when the child is going out to recess or coming back from recess or lunch, stop the child right at the beginning of the new activity. So, before entering the new situation, stop. Now, review with the child several rules that this child needs to remember to obey in the upcoming situation. These rules, of course, are going to be based upon whatever the problems are that you've experienced previously with this particular child. But keep the rules short in number, short in length, and have the child repeat them back to you to indicate that they understood and heard the rules. If necessary, you can even write the rules down on a 3x5 file card and hand the rules to the child at this point in time. Now, explain to the child what the incentive is in this activity for working, for behaving well, and for following these two to three rules. What rewards are you going to give them for good behavior? Explain this directly to the child briefly. Then, explain the discipline. What is going to happen if any of these rules are broken or other misbehavior occurs? Are you going to find them? Are you going to place them in timeout? Are you going to remove classroom privileges? Please explain what it is that you propose to do if a problem occurs. 
This way the child understands your plan. They know the rules, they know the rewards, and they know the punishment. Now, be sure to give them something active to do. So if you're telling them to go to their desk, tell them to get out something that you wish them to begin working on. But don't just have them sit idly by while you wait to start the activity. Then, as you begin the activity or this situation, follow your plan. Stick with it. As I said, act, don't yak. Manage the consequences that you've promised to use in this situation, and do so quickly. Reward throughout the activity. Don't just wait till the activity is over before giving the child the reward or incentive you promised. Disperse the tokens or the rewards intermittently across the activity. At the end of it, have the child evaluate for you how they think they did and then you can provide your own evaluation and discuss any differences in your perceptions of what happened. At this point, of course, you can complete giving the child the rewards that you wish to give them. They now have earned points or other rewards for how well they behaved in this activity. If you use transition planning at the beginning of each major transition in a school activity, and especially for those in which the child has previously had difficulty, you can reduce behavior problems by more than 50%. This is smart, proactive teaching rather than just reactive teaching. Reactive teaching is where you wait for a problem to develop before you do anything about it. In this case, you are trying to head the problem off before it occurs. Now, as I've said before, children with ADHD have very poor working memory, so they have trouble recalling and holding in mind rules and other important pieces of information they need to recollect in a particular task or situation. You can help to boost their working memory by writing down key pieces of information or rules in physical form, that is, on charts, on cards, on sticky notes, or other means of recording simple rules that can be placed in the child's visual field in a particular situation so that they can see the rules. This will help them to remember what it is they're supposed to do. Also, as I said earlier, you should do this with time as well. Make time real. Use clocks, timers, counters, and other devices to indicate the passage of time for this particular assignment. So, to remind you, Post the rules on posters at the front of the class, or use a three-sided stop sign as we did with young kindergarten and first grade children, uh, where we posted rules and reviewed them with these young children at the beginning of each activity. The red stop sign was usually in place during lectures, and it meant to sit still, pay attention, be quiet, raise your hand. When there were other activities, such as desk work activities going on, we turn the stop sign to its yellow color. And this is when students have to remain at their desk, but if they need help, they can come up and visit with the teacher. And then there was the green stop sign, which is when children were allowed to have free play in the classroom and to follow the rules uh, for that free play time. So the teacher simply changed the color of the stop sign, and on each stop sign were the simple rules to be followed in that particular activity. You can also put color-coded cards on the desk. Each card has the set of rules to follow for each academic subject or that particular class activity. Children simply flip to the color of the card that corresponds to that particular academic subject. Also, having the child restate rules before they start an activity is a way of helping them to boost their working memory for the rules as they enter the situation. And as I've said, you need to use timers like cooking timers or watches or digital uh, timing devices or time tape players, as I've already mentioned, in order to indicate to the child that time is passing because their internal clock is not very accurate and they're not likely to follow that clock in understanding how much time they have to get an assignment done. So make time physical. One means to do that is to use this large timing device, which is at about a foot tall. This timer can be uh, purchased at the ADD warehouse, and the teacher can set a time interval on the face of the clock over here. And then as the time progresses, you see that the red interval begins to reduce 
in size, and that indicates that time is passing, and how much time the child has left before the task is finished and the assignment is due. This is a very visible means of helping ADHD children to see the amount of time they have and how much time is left at any point during the assignment in order to know how to stay on task and get the work done within that time interval. Here's another timing device. These are small devices that contain little vibrators like a cell phone has in it. On the surface of each device there is a digital timer and there are various settings that you can set on the device. I'll explain in just a moment. But basically what happens is you can set the device to vibrate at a particular time interval. Suppose you want it to vibrate every five minutes. Then you would set the time on the device, like over here on the motivator, for five minutes. And it counts down the interval and then it vibrates and resets itself to five minutes and then counts down the interval again. So you can set this vibrating device to go off at frequent intervals and whenever the student wears the device and feels the vibration they know that another five minutes has passed. You can also set this device for its random setting in which case the vibrator will go off on a random intervals very much like the tone tape I described a few slides earlier. This variable interval can also be an effective means of reminding children to stay on task because time is passing. So there are various devices that you can get such as the motivator here or the habit change device that you see over here. Both are available at the addwarehouse.com. Now what about discipline in school? Well we've talked about a number of punishment strategies that might be used including fines uh, and uh, reprimands and so on. Obviously each school district typically has written policies for what teachers are allowed to do in order to discipline students in the classroom. So clearly teachers are going to have to refer to their uh, district manuals for the kinds of discipline that they're allowed to do. But let me show a list here of some of the forms of discipline that have proven to work for ADHD students. One of them is to give reprimands. And I know that many teachers say that reprimands don't work, but it's probably the way that they've delivered the reprimand. Susan O'Leary and her student Linda Feifner have done studies to indicate that when reprimands are delivered in a particular way, they do serve to correct behavior to some degree. And what they found is that to make it effective, you had to personalize the reprimand. That is, you had to go to the student and not yell from the front of the classroom. You had to make eye contact with the student. As I said, it might help to touch them on the shoulder or on their hand. Look directly in the eye and keep your reprimand very brief and private so that you can say it in a quiet, firm voice, but keeping it private from most of the other students. Make it personal. This way of delivering reprimands was far more effective than simply having teachers yell at students from the front of the classroom. Now another means of punishing students uh, is to have incentives for appropriate behavior uh, that are available uh, and then when punishment occurs it becomes more effective. There are two things that make punishment work. The first of these is there have to be adequate incentives in that situation to encourage pro-social and appropriate behavior. Otherwise, punishment is unlikely to succeed in reducing misbehavior. Second, the punishment has to be instituted quickly, within 10 seconds of the first occurrence of a misbehavior. The longer the teachers delay justice in this case, that is, the longer the teachers wait to discipline students, the less effective the discipline is going to be in altering that misbehavior. So remember, if you want discipline to be effective, even mild discipline can be effective for ADHD students if, first of all, there are lots of incentives in the classroom that encourage and reward appropriate behavior. And then, when discipline is to be implemented, the mild discipline should be instituted very fast on the heels of the first infraction and then it will succeed in adjusting that behavior. Now I know teachers are very familiar with timeouts as a form of discipline but we found that a variation of timeout was actually better than traditional timeout. This is called do a task and it was developed by Jim Swanson 
uh, Linda Feifner and their colleagues at the University of California, Irvine, in which they are operating an entire uh, school for ADHD students. In Duotask, the teacher has a desk, an empty desk, at the back of the classroom with a chair beside the desk. On this desk are to be mimeographed worksheets. This is simply busy bee kinds of work that any student in the class would be able to do. It can be math problems, it can be copying letters and numbers, it can be counting objects, whatever. It's just standard workbook worksheets like the kind you might buy at the store. Now keep these sheets on the desk at the back. Now explain to the students what you're going to do. If the student violates a rule, you're going to correct them. That is, you're going to tell them what they've done wrong, and you're going to give a number. For instance, you can say, you're out of your desk, give me two. What that means is that you're away from your desk when you're not supposed to be, and you now have to go to the desk at the back of the classroom to do your time out. The number you've been given is the number of worksheets you are to take off the pile and you are to complete. When you finish doing that number of worksheets, you can put them on the teacher's desk and then get back to your regular desk. The number of worksheets given determines the length of the timeout. But the beauty of this is that it also gives the student something to do in the timeout. We found that standard timeouts were difficult for ADHD children because they were boring and often led to an increase in restless, distractible, noisy, and disruptive behavior. It's not to say that timeouts can't be used. We just found that Duotask was better because it kept the student occupied during the timeout interval. It also allows the student to terminate the timeout by working quickly to get their worksheets done. And research shows that when students control the length of the timeout, that is, when they can terminate the timeout earlier by behaving well, that the timeout actually works better. So try the do a task as a variation on timeout. You can also take away tokens if you happen to be using a token system as a form of response cost, and this is a type of discipline as well. But again, it has to be done quickly on the first occurrence of misbehavior. You can have children write what are called moral essays, which is such things like why I won't do something in school again, such as why I won't hit other students or why it's wrong uh, to do this. Uh, research does show that for older students, moral essays do have some impact on improving their behavior. My guess is that, the, is that this works better for children in late elementary to middle school or later rather than with quite young children. You can establish a chill-out location, which is sort of like a timeout location, but it really is a place where the child can go to regain control over their emotions when they've become very upset or angry or unhappy about a situation. It's not meant to be punitive. It's simply meant to be a location where the child is free to go and take some time, count to ten, and try to recover their emotional control before returning themselves back to the classroom. Usually this can be a quiet corner in a part of the classroom. And the teacher can instruct the child to go there if the child appears to be particularly upset. But once the child feels that they've gotten control over their feelings, they can then come back to the classroom on their own. Finally, you can also use traditional timeout, which is simply placing the child in a chair in the corner of a classroom uh, that uh, keeps the child away from other students and the child sits there for a certain length of time based upon the severity of the infraction. If teachers are going to use traditional timeout, it should be done in the classroom or in a private room, not in the hallway outside the class. Research shows that hallway timeouts are far less effective than timeouts that are under formal supervision of a teacher. Finally, if the child has misbehaved seriously to the point where you're considering suspending them, we encourage the suspension to be done in the school building and not discharging the student to the streets to be unsupervised while their parents are at work. This in-school suspension can be done at the vice principal's office, at a behavior disorder classroom, in a corner of the gymnasium or in a corner of the cafeteria, so long as it's not lunchtime, a quiet place where the student is to go and do their assignments, but in which the student has been removed from their classroom for a certain period of time. Let's talk briefly about the kinds of things that you can do for teenagers in school. 
Now some of these I've already mentioned, and where that is the case I will go quickly through that material. But other suggestions here have not been discussed previously, and so I'll take a few moments to explain each of those. Now one of the first things that can be done that is quite useful for helping ADHD teens at school is to have them on medication uh, as needed. Now as I said, it's my experience that up to 70 to 80 percent of ADHD children and teens will need medication to help with school performance. So you might want to take my course on this website on ADHD medications to understand what those medications are and what their effects and side effects are likely to be. But as I've said previously, medications result in twice as much improvement in behavior for twice as many children with ADHD as do other psychosocial treatments such as the classroom behavior management methods I've described in this course. Also, if the teen does not wish to take their medication uh, or is becoming non-compliant with the medication, uh, then we encourage parents to arrange a behavior contract with the teenager where the teen can earn privileges for taking their medication that day. For instance, if the teen is driving or wants to go out later that day uh, to meet with friends or go to the mall for the a certain period of time on the weekend and so on. These can be earned by taking the medication daily. Parents can even pay the teenager a certain amount of money into their allowance for taking the medication each day. But try to make taking medication a win-win. Many teenagers do not like these medications uh, because of their side effects or because of the chance that they might be stigmatized by taking such medications. And this can be overcome by arranging to negotiate a contract with the teen for what they would like to have in exchange for using the medications. Now another effective tip for working with teens at school is to set up a coaching or mentoring uh, system at school. This takes just 15 minutes. <clears throat> Divide the 15 minutes up into three five-minute checkup points. One in the morning on arrival at school, one at noon, and one at the end of the day uh, as the school day is ending. During each of these checkups the student is going to go to their coach or mentor's office and that is going to be where their locker is. They're not going to have a formal locker. They're just going to have a location at the coach's office. This is where they go for their routine times when other students are going to their locker. But they need to go there at least three times during that day. Now, during each five-minute checkup, the coach is to organize the student for the upcoming subjects, that is, what books do they need, what assignments do they need, and so on. Where is their homework from the previous evening? Get the student organized. Give them a motivational pep talk. Give them a report card during the first morning's checkup, that behavior report card that you saw on an earlier slide of mine. The coach is going to use that report card to monitor this student across all of their subjects that day. Every time the student comes back to the coach, the coach is going to look at the report card to see how well they've done in the previous classes since the last visit. They can also record their assignments on the back of the report card or using a typical daily assignment sheet or a week at a glance calendar, for instance. But be sure to have teachers initial these assignments so that we know that the student has copied them correctly. The point of this is to make the student accountable across the school day to someone else for how well they're behaving and how well they're doing at getting their assignments and of course for helping to keep the student organized. Now this coach can be anyone at school, anyone with whom this student may have a friendly relationship. It can be a social worker, a psychologist, another teacher, uh, or it can be a vice principal. Anyone at school who's willing to give up five minutes to help a student can serve as a coach and to help us implement this daily accountability to someone else. So besides medication, besides coaching, besides the behavior report card and the daily assignment sheet, other things that schools can do include, for instance, the ADHD liaison that I've already mentioned in some of my earlier slides here, the daily report card that we've already spoken about in which students can actually earn their way off the card by behaving well for at least three weeks in which they get no fines on the behavior report card. 
We encourage families to keep an extra set of books at home in case the student forgets to bring a book home. You can do this by placing a deposit at the office at school for a second set of textbooks. And then when you return the textbooks at the end of the year, you get your deposit back. But this way, all books are at home. In case the student forgets and leaves a book at school that day, they can still get their assignment done. Again, I've talked about teaching students uh, typing or keyboarding skills to help with their writing problems so that they can uh, type their assignments rather than handwrite them uh, in high school if necessary. Also, students can record lectures in school using digital recorders. One interesting form of digital recording device is the smart pen, which appears on the next slide. The smart pen is available at livescribe.com. This is a pen that contains a digital recorder. And you see that you can tap at the bottom of these recording sheets that you see here. Notice that along the bottom you can tap on them and by doing so it turns the device on and off or pauses the device. It can also be used to go back and forward in the digital recording. This is a neat way of recording lectures while you're taking notes on the tablet so that you can review what the teacher said uh, afterwards when you're studying for an exam, for instance, or when you're doing your assignment, you can actually review the lecture itself. This is a great device for high school students and college students with ADHD, or even for adults with ADHD when they have to attend meetings to make sure that they've gotten as much information out of the lecture or the meeting as possible. Other tips that you might use for managing teenagers with ADHD is to reward them with money for the grades that they bring home. This is called Bucks for Bees. In the Bucks for Bees program, what you do is simply tell the student to bring home every sheet of paper, every assignment which contains a grade from the teacher. And you're going to pay them depending upon the grade that they have. So for instance, you might give them an extra dollar for every A, 50 cents for a B, 25 cents for a C. You can set up whatever the amount is based on the parent's ability to provide this kind of reward to the student. But the point is this, for every grade brought home, money can be earned in your allowance to supplement your allowance. And this simply encourages teens to bring home their work, but also it encourages teens to do better in order to earn more money uh, in their allowance. Now obviously you can use things like journals, week at a glance calendars, or other devices for helping the student to stay organized to remember assignments and deadlines uh, during the high school day. As I've said, schedule hard classes in the morning for ADHD children up through middle school, but by high school it's probably wise to schedule the more difficult classes in the afternoon hours, giving the alteration in the sleep-wake cycle that teenagers go through uh, when they hit um, their adolescence and their uh, maturation. So uh, this applies if they are on, uh, excuse me, if they are off medication. If they're on medication, then when the classes are scheduled, not so important a point. We like to alternate required classes with elective classes at high school or college in order to keep the student interested. Remember I said earlier for young children, alternate low or alternate, that is, low appealing activities with high appeal activities in order to periodically reward the student with high appeal activities. Now one standard recommendation that teachers often give when uh, students have to take time tests is to allow the ADHD student to have extra time on the exam. Research shows that extra time is not especially beneficial for ADHD students. Indeed, they tend to waste it. Most ADHD students are so impulsive and restless that they race through the exam and try to get out of the time test as early as possible. So, instead of giving them a, a period of time, of extra time, to do the exam, an alternate strategy that is proving to be more effective is to have them take the exam in a distraction-free environment and to use a strategy called time off the clock. Now, in this strategy, the ADHD student is given a stopwatch on their desk. When the exam begins, the stopwatch is turned on. However, at any point during the exam where the student wishes to, they can stop the clock, stretch, stand up, get a drink of water, return back to the task, 
and restart the stopwatch once they re-engage the test. They are not going to get any more face time with the test than other students. The stopwatch is recording how much contact time they have with the exam. But they can interrupt the exam any time they wish to take frequent breaks in order to rejuvenate their attention span. Uh, and we have found that doing so is much more likely to lead to improvement on examination than is simply giving extra time with no strategy as to how to break up the time uh, in order to perform the test better. So in a sense this is a way of having students go through an exam at self-paced time intervals. Now this will certainly take more time to complete the exam, but the extra time is a byproduct of the strategy. It is not the strategy itself. The strategy is taking tests in distraction-free environments and allowing the student frequent breaks from the work in order to rejuvenate their attention. Now, as I've said, permitting music during homework can be useful for teenagers in boosting their ability to get their homework done. Also, handing out a written syllabus uh, for a subject can help the student have material at home to study from uh, for examinations in particular. We've also talked about continuous note-taking whenever a student has to read something or listen to a lecture. Uh, and I talked about that earlier as a way of boosting the working memory problems in ADHD. You can use these strategies for teenagers as well. Also for teenagers, to help them with reading comprehension, you can go back and use a, a uh, method or strategy that's been around for more than three decades called SQ4R. This is a strategy that someone is to use while they're reading in order to improve their comprehension of what they're reading. The SQ4R is an acronym. It's an abbreviation that refers to the steps the student is to follow while they're reading. And the steps go as follows. Whenever you're given something to read, quickly survey the material, leaf through it, get a sense of what's there, how long it is, and so on. Then, draft some questions that you need to answer after you have read this material. Usually these are questions that are provided by the teacher as part of the reading assignment. But if there aren't any, then usually there'll be some at the back of the chapter that has to be read. Then, start the reading. Read only a paragraph. Stop. Now recite the major information out loud that you've learned in that paragraph. Next, write it down. Then, review your notes. You can see here where the four R's are coming from. Read, recite, write, and review. Do this with each paragraph as you progress through the material. Will this take longer? Probably not. Because the reason is, is that people with ADHD often have to go back and reread pages anyway in order to get information out of it. Indeed, you may find that they actually complete their reading assignments in less time by following this strategy because they no longer have to keep rereading the same material to get information out of it. Again, you can consider also doing peer tutoring and study buddy after school with other students to help high school students. Also, we encourage students to swap phone and fax numbers uh, so that they can rely on each other if they miss an assignment. They, after school, when they're home, they can contact what I call a fallback classmate to fall back on, so to speak, in order to get the missing assignment uh, and the sheets. Having fax numbers allow them, allows them to fax the assignment sheets to each other uh, if one happens to have missed the assignment that day. Obviously, having students attend after-school help sessions and getting after-school tutoring can be beneficial for high school students, not just for elementary school students. I also suggest that schools arrange for formal conferences every six weeks across the school year. These conferences are attended not only by parents and the teenagers' teachers, but by the teenager themselves so that they can participate in the meeting and hear how they're doing up to that point in time. We don't want teenagers going the full nine-week grading period and then finding out only on their grades whether or not there's been a problem in a particular subject, nor is it fair to parents to learn of this only when the grades come out. So having meetings more often, such as every four to six weeks, allows people to identify problems and do something about them early enough before they start to reflect badly on a student's report card. In conclusion, I hope you've learned that the school setting 
is one of the most impaired areas for ADHD children and teenagers. They suffer more severe impairments in this domain and suffer more such impairments than do other students. But ADHD symptoms can be effectively managed in the school environment. I have given you in this course more than 80 different strategies that you can use to improve the symptoms of ADHD and to help significantly improve the student's academic performance, behavior, and peer relationships in the school environment. We know a lot about how to manage ADHD effectively. But the key to success in adopting these strategies, I believe, is the teacher's attitude toward ADHD, their knowledge of ADHD as a true neurogenetic disability, and hence their compassion and willingness to implement these interventions and accommodations and sustain them across the school year to help benefit these disabled youngsters. I hope you have found this course to be informative. Thank you for taking my course. I invite you to take other courses I have prepared on this website at your convenience. Lastly, I invite you to visit guilford.com for more information about other products I have with regard to ADHD such as my three new rating scales for evaluating ADHD adults, one on ADHD symptoms, one assessing executive functioning, and another assessing functional impairment. I also invite you to explore other books I have on child and adult ADHD in the marketplace. You can obtain these not only from guilford.com, but also through major booksellers on the internet, such as amazon.com. Thank you again for taking this course. Goodbye.